I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us for this Dialogue Web Extra. We're continuing our conversation with INL Director John Grossenbarger, and we're talking about the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. We have a couple of, uh, let's get to our first phone caller quickly, Ingrid in Boise. Ingrid? Oh, hi. Thank you for taking my call. Uh -huh. I was wondering about the uh, long-term planning as these nuclear power plants are decommissioned or like in Japan where they're not going to be using them. What is, the, what is going to be the future use? Where are they going to evolve and how these are being used for energy or for what purpose? I'd like to know what kind of plans we would have in our own country as well as internationally for these uh, plants that are being decommissioned. Okay. Well, in terms of uh, the plants that are being decommissioned, the fuel will either be disposed of in a repository or in, the Japanese may choose to reprocess it and extract uh, usable components and then reuse them. Uh, the actual uh, decommissioning of the plants, the plan in most places when these plants are decommissioned is, is they're completely removed. There's, not th there's nothing left. The land can be reused for, w for whatever purpose. And as best I can tell today, you know, that's the plan the Japanese have, to completely demolish the structures and remove them. And they'll have to see what they have left, what the residual you know, radioactivity is and what uh, kind of restrictions that would put on its use. Um, but right now, uh, everybody that's in this business looks at complete reuse. We have an email that came in that asked how much radioactive iodine was in the was released into the atmosphere. That's a good question. I don't remember. I don't remember how many curies of iodine were released. I mean, there were, there were a lot. There was a lot of iodine which decays very rapidly, and then cesium and strontium. The cesium, in particular, was is one of the big contaminants uh, outside the uh, outside the site. The radiation exposures were, you know, nobody in the general public got. Uh, there were about ten people that got a dose. It's about the equivalent of a CT scan. Uh, and workers, you know, there were some workers that got internal contamination. There's about a dozen of them that got doses that uh, we think may, may, there's some evidence it might increase their likelihood of cancer. And external exposure, there's about 200 that got more than we allow somebody to get in a year, but none of those doses are anywhere near uh, life-threatening doses. So. Uh, even though there was a lot of uh, radioactive iodine and cesium uh, spread by the steam venting from the plants, the uh, the impact on public health was relatively relatively minor. And I think that's not the message people may have got from all the coverage. Yeah. One of the cr one of the reports uh, produced in Japan criticized U.S. media for its coverage of the of the accident. Yeah, there's no no one has been killed, nor do we expect anyone to die. No one's going to die from the radiation exposures that have occurred other than there may be a slight increase in risk to cancer from some of the workers. Two people died at Fukushima Daiichi. They were killed by the tsunami, by the water, not by radiation. Okay. Let's get to our other caller. Rocky in Firth. Rocky. Well, I guess the follow-up to that is, um, I know in the United States we monitor all the milliram um, uh, dosage that we all receive. Will we, will we use the information from uh, the disaster there in Japan and follow up on the the people that are there to see um, mm. whether our standards are correct and whether we are too stringent or too are less stringent than we need to be? No, absolutely. And the, the Japanese have already taken that on. I mean, they're doing an extensive monitoring program and health effects uh, monitoring, and we'll, we will learn from that. Uh, you know, and they're ob obviously monitoring the, the plant life, the, the sea life, the biology, and, and any effects on the, bi on the biology of this radiation. But we'll, we will add to our knowledge of the impacts of low-level radiation exposure, which is a carcinogen, which at low levels causes cancer, at high levels uh, causes what we call radiation poisoning and, and, and even death. So um, um, it's a lot of the initial information understanding we have of radiation exposure actually started with the Japanese atomic bomb uh, victims, and uh, they have been extensively studied. And, and again, the Japanese are, uh, are all over this issue in, in terms of making sure they protect the health of their population, and that they, they and the world learn from this, and that it adds to our knowledge of the impact of low-level radiation exposure. Well, I have you. I did want to ask about something a little bit closer to mm -hmm. home. The, uh, the, it was announced that you're going to be laying off folks out of the Idaho National Laboratory mm -hmm. about um, 185? Right. What does that say for the health of and future for the Idaho National Laboratory? 
Well, that, that particular um, workforce restructuring is focused on, first of all, adjusting skill sets. Sometimes we have the wrong skill mix because uh, programs changed you know, and, and we don't need the same uh, n numbers of people with specific skills. So in a given year, there probably ought to be some small adjustment uh, because of that. What's a small adjustment? Maybe 50 people. Um, what this reflects is a shift in, in uh, although the country's investment in nuclear energy research was about the same this year as the previous year, um, not all of it uh, comes to Idaho. That's, uh, that's part of it. And some priorities are shifting. Um, there's more of a priority being put on um, not only because of Fukushima, but because of the Blue Ribbon Commission and what are we going to do with used fuel in the U.S. There's more emphasis on what we call the back end of the fuel cycle um, and not reactor as much on reactor work. That's a fair way to say it. So there's some impact because of that and some because our, um, our non-nuclear energy and our uh, national and homeland security programs that uh, there's some reduction in the funding associated with those. So how did we fare under the president's proposed budget, realizing that yeah. that, of course, is just a number to start with? It's about a 10 percent reduction in nuclear energy, which I find uh, dismaying when you look at uh, the investments in fossil and renewables, um, they all increase and nuclear, uh, you know, nuclear is reduced by 10 percent. So we'll see. I mean, we'll, uh, that's the president's budget request to the Congress and the Congress will work its will and, and we'll see what happens. But uh, nuclear energy is a long-term enterprise and uh, the government has a critical role to play in it. Everywhere outside the United States, it's almost entirely government enterprise. So if we don't invest in it, then uh, you know, our citizens aren't going to have the benefits, uh, the choice of, uh, of nuclear technologies, except as we buy it from others, which raises issues of uh, you know, the U.S. leadership and role in non-proliferation, non preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and the security issues associated with uh, nuclear materials, because it's clear the rest of the world is going to continue to pursue nuclear energy in a very big way to, uh, to meet our future energy needs. Governor Otter uh, signed an executive order creating a commission to try and help uh, support the Idaho National, Lab Idaho National Laboratory. What's going to happen with that? Well, what I hope will happen, and uh, of course it will be up to the commission, I, what I hope will happen is that they'll look at the current status of, um, of uh, Idaho's leadership role in nuclear energy. I mean, the, the way I, uh, I see it, the state uh, accepts certain burdens by being the home of the Idaho National Laboratory. You know, there's 890 square miles dedicated to that effort, shipments of radioactive material in and out of, uh, out of the state. Um, there are burdens associated with that, and, and uh, there are benefits, uh, including the presence of the lab, employment, those kinds of things. Well, uh, what's that look like today, and what do we want it to be uh, for the future, I think? is something that I hope the Commission looks at and, and discusses very seriously and very carefully. I, I, I think it's important that they look at the relationship between the federal government and the state, which in the past was strongly influenced by cleaning up the waste at the site. Uh, well, we're in a position now where the cleanup contractors are getting close to the finish line. Uh, there's a couple big projects left to do, but in the next uh, two to five years, they are essentially done. So that aspect of the federal government's commitment has been met. Now what? What's left? And the, and the other dimension that, that I think has to be addressed is Idaho has a burden of used nuclear fuel and what's called high-level radioactive waste um, that is supposed to go to a repository. Well, at least currently it looks like we, we don't have one with Yucca Mountain. And there's, of course, that's an intensely political issue. and. Uh, and we'll see what, what path uh, we take from here. But uh, there were certain deadlines that the state expected that material to be removed. Well, it's not going to be removed so because it has no place to go. So what does that mean? Uh, I think uh, the provisions are the state can find the federal government starting in uh, 2035. Is that really what we want to do? Uh, and meanwhile, I think it, it helps uh, for people in Idaho to look at the burdens and benefits relative to other states. So, for example, the state that has the most used nuclear fuel, I mean, by far, Idaho has about 300 metric tons. There's about 70,000 
tons of commercial fuel, and Illinois has the most because it has a large number of commercial power reactors. Of the government sites, the three with high-level waste are Hanford in Washington, Savannah River in uh, South Carolina, and Idaho. And Idaho, by all measures, uh, carries the, the, the least burden in our country. So if Idaho is the national nuclear laboratory, the country's lead institution for nuclear energy, uh, how does the state view that role? Uh, how do, what relationship do they want with the federal government in fulfilling those responsibilities? And what does it mean, you know, what does it mean to the state? I think it's a great time to, to have that discussion and look at all aspects of it. And I'm, I'm going to be very happy to tell the commission what I think, you know, what we at the lab think is the future of, uh, of the institution of the Idaho National Laboratory and its importance both to the world and, uh, and to the United States in terms of the future of nuclear energy. So I'm very excited about it. And as, as we wrap this up, I, I, w I did want to bring up that last November there were uh, 16 I, I know right. workers who right. were exposed to a great amount of radiation. There was some criticism that the procedures weren't being followed. What has happened since that in terms of relooking at safety at the Idaho National Laboratory? Well, of course, um, you know, our, our three priorities are always world-leading safety behavior, environmental stewardship, taking care of our people, and mission accomplishment. I mean, we live those all day, every day. And it's safety in things nuclear, it's safety in driving our buses. Uh, it's extraordinarily important to us. And when somebody at the lab gets hurt or has the potential to get hurt, that's a, that's a huge deal and a very a big issue for us. Uh, and we care first and foremost about those people. In this case, some people were exposed to plutonium, and they actually inhaled some plutonium as they were unpacking a, um, a about a one inch by eight inch plate uh, and inspecting it for shipment. They weren't doing any science or experimentation on it. Um, there were lots of issues relative to why this occurred, but in the main, you know, uh, to protect people from the hazardous work we do, and we do lots of hazardous work all day, every day, we have engineered controls, building facilities, glove boxes, those kinds of things. We have administrative controls, processes and procedures, and then we have human performance. I mean, we have these terrific people, but, you know, people aren't perfect. They make mistakes. So when, when people make mistakes, when machines fail, does that system make sure that even though things happen that you didn't want to happen, that you're happy with the outcome. Well, in this case, we weren't. It failed. And why did it fail? The, the, uh, the biggest reason was we failed to anticipate that a, one of these plates could fail this way, that the material in the plate could be so easily airborne that, uh, that it was possible for this to happen. Um, we, you know, we call that the estimating the hazard. Uh, so what we've done is we've gone back and, and we've been doing it this way for a long time, handling these plates in this manner for decades with success and not infrequently. I mean, we handle them frequently. So we didn't think about, we didn't understand, actually we still don't fully understand, we can just conservatively estimate what, would, what happened with this plate over the 30 years that no one saw it or touched it. So how many other evolutions like that do we have? Well, we're doing things that we've done for many, many years, but we haven't thought about, you know, when that piece of material nobody has looked at for decades. Has it changed? Is the fact that it's wrapped in polyethylene and duct tape, is there, is there some interaction that's going to occur there? We don't know. So let's, let's be very conservative in how we deal with it, again, so that engineered administrative human performance controls works. So we've looked at those kinds of things, uh, gotten some uh, people that used to work at the lab in to see if, if uh, there were things that you know, we're missing. We'll get um, outside validation that you know, people who don't look at what we do uh, every day to see if we've missed, uh, missed anything. And, and then in some areas, you know, we're looking at the, the balance of human performance, engineered controls, administrative controls, upgrading the administrative controls, and eh, let's be more procedurally specific here. In some areas, we need to train our people better, in some cases give them more education, so that when they are confronted with an uncertainty, um, because part of our work is dealing with uncertainties all the mm -hmm. time, that, um, that they'll do the right thing. Um, 
So I think it's uh, resulted in us looking at that very closely from the standpoint certainly of all of our nuclear operations. I mean, it really applies to everything we do. And I think uh, we're, we're better for it. Uh, you know, we're not happy about it. We're very uh, um, both disappointed in ourselves and it's very, very difficult for us to see the potential of some of our uh, people getting hurt. In the end, the controls uh, that were in place certainly protected the public. Uh, there was no risk to the environment. Uh, and it looks like we're still doing the final dose estimates for these people, but it looks like that uh, none of them will, get, will have gotten a dose that has any um, health effects. But that's, uh, you know, that's luck, not skill, and that's not how we operate. So um, that's, what's, uh, that's what's going on, and, uh, and we've already learned from it and made lots of changes. We're not done yet. Um, some of the activities in terms of raising standards, education, training, They'll, they'll take a couple years to get them where, uh, where we want them because uh, we want to, in radiological controls and nuclear operations, we're, we don't want to be as good as everyone else. You know, we have to be the best in the world, and, uh, and we're still on that path. All right, sir. We've run okay. out of time. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you joining us. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time on our Dialogue Web Extras.